Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about chapter 13 from Campbell's Biology and Focus, which will cover the molecular basis of inheritance. So let's talk about life's operating instructions. We know that we're talking about DNA here. So back in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick introduced the elegant double helical model for the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. And if you ask me or anyone else, they kind of stole it from Rosalind Franklin, but whatever, that's besides the point. Um, so DNA is the substance of inheritance. It's the most celebrated molecule of our time. This is the secret to unlocking the human or any kind of genetic code, right? Um, but studying DNA for our own purposes is selfish, but interesting. Um, so hereditary information is encoded in DNA and reproduced in all cells of the body. This is called DNA replication. So literally the process of replicating or making more of our DNA. We've talked about this previously when we've talked about the S phase of the um, interface step of the cell cycle in order to replicate the DNA to have two sets of DNA. So when those cells split, there's enough DNA for each of the cells to survive. So now we're gonna look at that process and like what happens. This is a picture of Watson and Crick. Again, they're studying the double helical shape of our DNA molecule and they stole this research from Rosalind Franklin with her X-ray crystallography. She died before she could win the Nobel Prize because x-rays are dangerous, so they got the credit for it. Okay, so DNA is the genetic material. We know this. So in the early 20th century, the identification of the molecules of inheritance loomed as a major challenge to biologists. They weren't sure if it was like protein or nucleic acid that was actually carrying the genetic code. There was a huge debate whether it was in an amino acid code that makes up a protein or if it was in a nucleic acid code that makes up our RNA and our DNA molecules. Okay, so we're gonna talk about um, Morgan's group showed that genes were located on chromosomes and two components of the chromosomes, the DNA and the protein became the candidates for the genetic material, which is what I was just saying. Basically, we knew that we had genetic material, we knew that we have heredity, we know that we have these traits and these genes that are getting passed on from generation to generation. We did not know if that was called DNA or if it was called protein. We didn't know which one of these molecules was responsible for actually carrying our genetic code. So the key factor in determining the genetic material was choosing um, approximate experimental organisms, or I'm sorry, appropriate experimental organisms. So a lot of scientists studied, um, you know, the differences between DNA and protein in um, bacterial cells because they are very easy to grow. Um, and we'll talk about some of them in just a minute. Uh, so the role of DNA and heredity was first discovered by studying bacteria, like I said, and the viruses that infect them. So a virus that infects a bacteria is called a bacteriophage, or just phage for short. So a bacteriophage is a virus that can only attack bacteria cells. They cannot attack eukaryotic cells. They're actually um, a hot topic in cancer research at the moment because they can be engineered to, you know, attack certain types of cells, like, you know, maybe cancer. So that'd be really cool someday. But bacteriophages are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. So we're going to discover that DNA can transform. Okay, so um, basically the discovery of the genetic role of DNA began with the experiments that Frederick Griffith composed. So he worked with two different strains of a bacteria. So he had one that was pathogenic and one, oops, one that was pathogenic and one that was harmless. So one could cause disease and one was totally not gonna hurt you at all. Okay, so two different strains of the same bacterium. So when he mixed the heat killed remains of the pathogenic. So you have all these little bacteria that are dangerous, you heat them up and then they become heat killed, which means that they're going to break open, they're going to lice, they're going to release all of their um, you know, intracellular components to the extracellular environment because you have broken them up because you've heat killed them. So the remains of the pathogenic strain, whatever was on the inside, when you mix it with living cells, of the harmless strain. Now this harmless strain became pathogenic. So you have the harmful cells, you heat them up, you break them open. So there's all this stuff floating around. We know that that stuff is DNA, it's protein, there's you know um, ribosomes here. 
when you mix that with the harmless cells, they became pathogenic. So when you kill the dangerous ones over here and you break them open and they have all this stuff that spewed out of these broken, dead, dangerous cells, you mix that with the harmless living cells. Now the living cells that were previously harmless are now pathogenic and they're causing disease, okay? So he called this phenomenon transformation. So now it's defined as a change in genotype and phenotype due to assimilation of foreign DNA. So essentially bacteria are pretty cool because these little bacterial cells can take up DNA from the environment and incorporate it into their own cells, which means that now they're going to be creating all of the genes from that DNA. So if they picked up DNA that's from a dangerous bacteria, then they can start making whatever was dangerous about it. If it was a toxin that it was creating, whatever. Now these little you know, these little happy harmless cells have now become devil cells because they are now dangerous because they're expressing the DNA from the dangerous strain of the bacteria. Okay, so here's what this looks like. So you have the living S cells and S is smooth. Okay, S is for smooth. So the living S cells is the control group. You inject that into a mouse, the result is that the mouse dies. Okay, the living R cells, which means rough, because they don't have this um, around the outside here, it's called a lipopolysaccharide layer, which kind of allows these bacteria to hide from the immune system, which is why the mouse dies, because it's able, it has this kind of shield around the outside that protects it from being detected by the immune system. So the R cells, the rough cells, they are not protected, right? There's no coating around them. There's nothing like that there. So they can be detected by the immune system, which means that we have a healthy mouse because the immune system is going to clear that, okay? So we have the S1 is bad, okay? This one kills the mouse. This one is totally okay, all right? The heat killed S cells. When you take these cells and you heat them up and you destroy them, you break them open so all of their little materials are floating around and you inject that into a mouse, the mouse is fine. Now, when you take these little particles from our killed virulent or pathogenic bacteria and you mix it with our living R cells that previously were not harmful, this is what you get. The mixture of the heat killed S cells and the living R cells, the mouse dies. So that means that something happened to these R cells to make them bad cells. And what did they do? They picked up DNA from the environment and incorporated it into their little bacteria bodies. Then they started expressing those traits because they were able to do protein synthesis and express that bad DNA, okay? So that is how they were able to transform by picking up this DNA. And then when you extracted a blood and then looked for the cells that were in the blood, you found living S cells. Notice I said living S cells. We're dealing with only R cells. So by taking up this DNA, basically those R cells got taken over and then they became transformed into S cells. So that's what happened in this experiment. So later, that was built upon. Okay, Avery and others identified, like McLeod and Avery, they identified um, the transforming substance as DNA. So before, they didn't really know what was causing this to happen, but now we know that it was, in fact, DNA that was entering these harmless cells and making them harmful cells. So many biologists remained skeptical, mainly because little was known about DNA, and they thought that proteins were better candidates for the genetic material. So a lot of people were still on board with proteins, but we know that that is not the correct answer. We know that the genetic material is, in fact, DNA, and a lot of people were um, supportive of the DNA being the genetic material, but there were still some that had doubt that protein was a better candidate for the genetic material. Okay, so more evidence for DNA as the genetic material came from the studies of viruses that infect bacteria. And we talked about this a minute ago. They are called bacteriophages. So such viruses called bacteriophages or phages for short are widely used in molecular genetics research. A virus is DNA, 
or RNA. If it's RNA, it's called a retrovirus, which you may have heard of. That's what it just retrovirus is RNA containing virus. So a virus is DNA or RNA, some sort of nucleic acid that's enclosed by a protective protein coat. Do you see what we're doing here? We have DNA and we have protein and that's it for a virus. So if we're trying to figure out which one of these things is the genetic code, well, it's good to work with something that only has DNA and protein. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. So the viruses uh, must infect cells and take over the cell's metabolic machinery in order to reproduce. A virus is not alive. If you just have virus laying around, it's not alive. It requires a host because it will embed the DNA into the host cell and then that DNA will take over the cell's machinery. It will take over all of the enzymes. It will take over the ribosomes in order to create its own proteins to meet its own agenda. So a virus is an opportunist, it sits around, it waits until it is incorporated into a host body and infects host cells. This is a picture of what a bacteriophage looks like. To me, they look like little cookie robots from like Despicable Me, you know what I mean? Like this is literally what they look like, they're little cookie robots. So the part that I just drew here, that's the protein coat inside of the head that's the DNA. That's literally it. They are not alive. There are no organelles. They are not cells. They are viruses. They are not dead. They are not alive. They're just this like gray material in science. So there are these little particles called a virus. It's surrounded by protein and it contains DNA in the head. And that's what we're trying to differentiate between. Is it protein or is it DNA that passes on genetic information? So here's where we're going to find out. So Hershey and Chase showed that DNA is the genetic material of a phage known as T2. So that's just the name of the virus that they're working with. Remember, a phage is short for bacteriophage, which is just a virus that infects bacteria. So they showed that DNA is the genetic material. So Hershey and Chase's experiment was kind of like the irrefutable, you know, everyone else has kind of led to this discovery, but then they settled it. So to determine this, they designed an experiment showing that only the DNA of a T2 phage and not the protein enters an E. coli cell during infection. E. coli is a bacteria and T2 phage is a bacteriophage. Remember that that is a virus that only infects bacteria. Okay. So they concluded that the injected DNA of the phage provides the genetic information. So we're going to go through and talk about their experiment. So Hershey and Chase proved that DNA contains the genetic information. So here's what they did. So they have bacteriophage and they have bacterial cells. Now, you know, the phages are going to inject their DNA. It's kind of like a little syringe. Think about like getting a shot. Like they're going to literally push their DNA inside of a bacterial cell. Okay, so there's two different parts of this experiment. You'll see that there's batch one listed up here and that there's batch two listed over here. This one is dealing with radioactive sulfur and this one is dealing with radioactive phosphorus. So sulfur, think about where you would find this. Okay, so when you have a carbohydrate, you have CHO, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, a lipid, CHO. When you're dealing with a protein, CHONS. And when you're dealing with a nucleic acid, C-H-O-N-P. So you notice that S for sulfur is only found in proteins, right? And you notice that the P, phosphorus, is only found in nucleic acids. So we are labeling the sulfur in this protein and we are labeling the phosphorus in this DNA. When you radioactively label it, it's able to glow, right? So you can physically see that there's either a glowing or lack of glowing occurring, okay? So in the first batch, you have radioactive sulfur. So this means that you have labeled the protein. The protein is what will glow, okay? So you have the labeled phages that infect the cells. Now remember the structure of a bacteriophage that I drew for you earlier. Outside is the protein, inside is the DNA. So you labeled sulfur, which is in the protein. So basically the outside of this little guy here, this little bacteriophage is what contains the label. So the bacteriophages inject their DNA into the bacteria. So then after they were able to um, 
they do this and then they let the bacteria kind of like rest and grow for a little bit. So agitation is going to, they literally put them in like a special blender and agitation is going to free the outside phage parts from the cells. So they're knocking off the protein coats. You can see that that's happening here. So basically you'll just have these guys like floating around in the medium and then you'll have the um, bacterial cell that has the DNA inside of it. So then they centrifuge the pellets to form a pellet. So centrifuge is when you spin something really, really, really fast and all of the things that have um, basically mass will sink to the bottom to form a pellet and anything that is like super fine will typically still say it still stay in a solution unless you keep centrifuging it like forever. So this pellet down at the bottom is where the bacteria was located because the bacteria has a lot more mass than these little, you know, empty shells of protein. So what they found was that it was the liquid that was glowing. Now, what did we label? We labeled the sulfur, which was only in the shell of the bacteriophage. So the shell of the bacteriophage, the protein, is in this liquid and it glows, which means that that is where the protein is. Well, I told you that there's only two parts of a bacteriophage. So if the protein is out here, the DNA has to be inside of the bacteria here. And if we see glowing happening here in the solution, you know that what you labeled is not inside of the bacteria. So we can see here that the protein never went inside of the bacteria, which means that protein cannot be the genetic material because it never even entered the cell. So now let's look at the second batch. The second batch down here is where they used radioactively labeled phosphorus. Now phosphorus makes up the phosphate sugar backbone in DNA, okay? So here we have a radioactively labeled DNA. You have the, um, the same little bacteriophages, right? But this time we did not label the protein. We labeled the DNA on the inside here. So you can see that the uh, bacteriophages are shooting their DNA inside of the cell. You do the same thing. You then agitate the cells to pop off anything that's remaining on the outside of the cell. And then you look at the centrifuged pellet. So after you have spun the solution a whole bunch, you have a pellet down at the bottom. The pellet is glowing. So that means the bacteria are in the pellet and the bacteria are glowing, which means that they have that DNA inside of them. Whereas the liquid is not glowing, that is just the empty protein coats. So this proved that the DNA, which contains phosphorus, right, is the um, transforming molecule. It's the molecule that's responsible for heredity. It's the molecule that's responsible for carrying the genetic code. So this is how they discovered it with the um, Hershey and Chase experiments that were just a build up, uh, a build off of everyone else that came before them. They all relied on each other, but this one is what really showed that DNA is in fact the molecule of our, our genetic information. Okay, so it was known that DNA is a polymer of nucleotides, each consisting of a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate group. I want you to know this structure for my kids. It's a sugar with a phosphate and a nitrogenous base. So you end up with a sugar and a phosphate. Oops, I just lied to you. You'd have a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogenous base. A phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And that's what makes up DNA. It's just these little nucleotides that have these three parts to them. So Erwin Chargoff reported that DNA composition varies from one species to the next. So we're all made of the same parts. We have these nucleotides, whether you're grass, a snail, a lizard, a donkey, a horse, a human, whatever. Anything that is alive is made up of nucleotides. Our DNA is made up of nucleotides, okay? But it differs from one species to the next. So. This evidence of diversity made DNA a more credible candidate for the genetic material. So now that we've proven that DNA is in fact the carrier of our genetic material, um, Chargoff kind of went on to solidify other scientists who were still doubtful. Like they, they started buying into the idea a little bit more after his experiments. 
So this is the overall structure of our DNA. So you can see a nucleotide. Well, this is one half. I'm sorry. This is one half of our DNA ladder. So you can see a phosphate sugar backbone or sugar phosphate backbone. It's alternating. It's called an alternating phosphate sugar backbone. How do you know? Phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. You get the point. It's alternating. That's why it's called an alternating phosphate sugar backbone. We're very creative as scientists. And then on the inside here, you have our nitrogenous bases. They are called thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Okay, so to make up a nucleotide that all of our DNA is made of, you need those three parts. You need a phosphate, you need a sugar, and you need a nitrogenous base. So here you have another nucleotide. Here you have another nucleotide. Here you have another nucleotide. So in this picture, we have one, two, three, and four nucleotides. And you can see our four nitrogenous bases represented here. So this is one half of our DNA molecule because we know that DNA is a double-stranded helix. This is only one strand. Okay, so two findings became known as Chargoff's rule. The base composition of DNA varies between species and any species and in any species, the number of A and T bases is equal and the number of G and C bases is equal. So the basis for these rules was not understood until the discovery of the double helix. But basically, Chargoff did um, weight experiments where he essentially said that, you know, there's this many A's and that happens to be equal to this many T's because of the structure of the molecules. He was able to identify them based on weight. And then um, G's and C's were equal to each other. So I like to tell my kids that A always pairs with T. We know this. It's called Chargoff's rule. I say apples grow on trees. A goes with T. G and C always go together. Gas goes in cars. Apples grow on trees. Gas goes in cars. Okay. So A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. So this is called Chargoff's rule. And this is what it says. Our nitrogenous bases have to pair like this. And I like to even go a step further just to tell my kids the two sides of the DNA molecule are held together by hydrogen bonds. And that's between these nitrogenous bases that we're talking about. So I like to take it a step further and say, a, 2, T, G, 3, C, because this represents the number of hydrogen bonds between these molecules. That's a little bit advanced, but that's what I like to start telling them here. A, 2, T, G, 3, C. If you can remember that, you're pretty good for Chargoff's rule. Okay, so Watson and Crick were the first to determine the structure of DNA. Yay, we get to talk about Rosalind Franklin. So um, Wilkins and Franklin were used to um, were using a technique called X-ray crystallography to study the molecular structure. So they actually discovered that it was some sort of round structure. So Franklin produced a picture of the DNA molecule using this technique. That's what actually led to her death, actually, because she was around X-rays a whole lot, which is radiation, and that ended up killing her. So if you're looking down, you know that DNA is kind of like this shape, right? If you're looking from like your eyeball is here, right? And you're looking down at the top, like these are your little eyelashes and your bottom ones. Okay, if you're looking down at a DNA molecule, this is what you would see. Because you have these like helical spirals, like that's, it would look like an X kind of like this. So this was the first image of DNA. Okay, so Franklin's extra crystallographic image of DNA enabled Watson to deduce that DNA was helical. The X-ray images also enabled Watson to deduce the width of the helix and the spacing of the nitrogenous bases. So the pattern in the photo suggests that the DNA molecule is made up of two strands forming a double helix. And that's where we get our beautiful double helix that looks kind of like that. Okay, so here's our overall double helical structure. And this is it flattened out like a ladder. And then this is like actually like a three dimensional, like what it would actually space filling model, what it would look like. So I want to focus on the middle ladder here. We already talked about um, Chargoff's rule and I talked about hydrogen bonding in our last slide. So if you look here, there's two hydrogen bonds because this is T and this is A, A to T, G, 3C, see how that works. 
Okay, hydrogen bonds are always represented by a dotted line because they're very weak bonds, but it's very important that they are weak bonds in this case. So you'll notice this is, you know, the overall structure of our DNA ladder. So you see a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So those three components make up a nucleotide. Here's another nucleotide because we have those three components. Same thing here, same thing here. Okay, then the other side, you'll notice is upside down. You'll notice that it's like the phosphates are down here. It's upside down. So here's one and two, three, and four. So in this picture, you have eight nucleotides. Okay, but also notice, I'm just gonna erase some of this stuff so it's actually easier to talk about. Um, notice that we have a five prime end here and we have a three prime end here. And on the other side, we have a three prime and a five prime. That's what that little dash means. So DNA runs in an anti-parallel direction. So you can say that the directionality of DNA is considered anti-parallel because they run in opposite directions. Like one strand is upside down. What the five and the three mean is basically on the sugar molecule, if you count the carbons, that this is on the fifth carbon. So you'd have like one, two, three, four, and five carbons. That's why that is the five prime end. Whereas you'd have carbon one, two, and three. That's why this is the three prime end. So the primes are, that's just the convention how you, um, count the carbons of a sugar, you always start in the same position. So the prime is just telling you that that is the number of side of the molecule that you're on, the carbon that you're touching. The phosphate is attached to that side, okay? Um, so that's the directionality, the anti-parallel direction of our DNA molecule. So Watson and Crick built models of a double helix to con um, conform to the X-ray measurements and the chemistry of DNA. So Franklin had concluded that there were two outer sugar phosphate backbones. So we know that that's our backbones. And then in the middle, we have our nitrogenous bases. Okay, with the nitrogenous base pairs in the molecules interior. So Watson built a model in which the backbones were anti-parallel, which is what we just talked about. They run in opposite directions, five prime to three prime. So the other side would be three prime to five prime. It's like one's upside down. At first, Watson and Crick thought the bases paired uh, like with like, so A pairs with A and so on, but such pairings did not result in a uniform width. So instead, pairing a purine with a pyrimidine resulted in a uniform width consistent with the X-ray data. Does it talk about that? Yes, okay. So the purines and pyrimidines are the two different classes, are two classes of nucleotides and it has to do with their shape and their size. So let's look at that. So here, if you have a purine and a purine, it's too wide. A purine, I like to think short name, big structure. They have two rings, two carbon rings there. Short name, purine, big structure. And then the other one is called a pyrimidine, big name, small structure. It's the opposite of what you would think. And here you have this one carbon ring. So if these represent the backbones, the pink lines represent the backbones of our DNA molecule. If you put a purine and a purine, it is too wide. If you put a pyrimidine and a pyrimidine, it is too narrow. It would cause the backbone to like do this crazy sort of like and that's not the correct image for DNA. We know that because of Rosalind Franklin's work. Okay. If you put a purine and a pyrimidine together, that is the correct width. So you need three carbon rings and that works out. So how can you remember purines and pyrimidines? Does it tell you? No. Okay. I'll tell you. So I went to Texas A&M for both of my degrees and I like to think about Aggie rings, they are pure gold. I mean, they're not, but like, just go with it, okay? They are, quote, pure gold. Aggie rings, pure gold. Purine equals Ag, like pure 
Aggies. Okay, class of 14, woohoo. Okay, so um, I like to think pure Aggies, pure Aggies, pure gold, okay? Um, and then pyrimidine is just going to be our, um, pyrimidine is just basically the other two, CT. I don't have anything to remember that, but those are the four nitrogenous bases. And if you know what two of them are, well, then the other two obviously have to be the other option. So you have two purines that are adenine and guanine, and you have two pyrimidines that are cytosine and thymine. Okay, so Watson and Crick reason that the pairing was more specific, um, that's dictated based on the, the structures. So that's where we get our purines and pyrimidines and the correct width of our overall molecule. So they determined that adenine paired only with thymine and guanine paired only with cytosine. Remember, apples grow on trees, gas goes in cars. A always pairs with T, G always pairs with C. And I like to remember A2T, G3, C for the carbon, I mean, the hydrogen bonds. So Watson and Crick model explains the Chargoff's rule that in any organism, the amount of A is equal to T because they always pair together. If you've got an A, it's got to have a buddy, which is T. Okay, and then the amount of G and C, always they go together. You have to have an equal number. So you can actually solve for these, and some classes like to ask you this. Let's say that you have an organism that has 100 base pairs in their total DNA genome. Okay, and we know that there are 20 adenine, and it's going to ask you to solve how many thymine, how many guanine, how many cytosine. You are given the total, and you are given one of the bases. Well, we know we have 100, and if 20 of them are A, and A and T always pair together, that means that 20 of them also have to be T. That has to be true. You can't have 21A and 19T, then you have guys without buddies, and you can't have that. Okay, so they have to be equal. So that makes up 40. And when you do 100, our total minus 40, you end up with 60. But now we need to find out what G and C are. Well, hey, there's two of those and there's a round number here. We're going to divide it by two to give you 30, which means that we have 30 guanine and we have 30 cytosine. That checks out. So you might be asked a question similar to that on an exam. I know a lot of teachers like to use that. This is the overall structure for you again of the sugars and how they pair together. Remember A2T, G3C, there are two hydrogen bonds here and here between A and T and between G and C, there are three G3C hydrogen bonds. I don't require that my kids know the structures of these, but you can tell that adenine is a purine because it has two rings and thymine would of course be a pyrimidine guanine a g ag pure purine and pyrimidine here so i hope that that helps you a little bit with the structure of dna okay so uh, many proteins work together in dna replication and repair so now we're actually going to get to how we make more DNA. We know that DNA is the genetic information. We know that in the cell cycle, we have the S phase, which is called synthesis. What are we synthesizing? We're synthesizing an extra copy of DNA. So the relationship between the structure and function is um, manifested in the double helix here. So Watson and Crick noted that the specific base pairing suggested a possible copying mechanism for this genetic material. So if you look at this, okay, before we look at that, I lied to you. You know that DNA is two strands that pair together. So if I told you, this is my sugar phosphate backbone, that I have A, T, C, you could tell me what the other half of it is. Because if I have an A, well, it has to pair up with a T. And there's going to be two hydrogen bonds in between. And if I have a T, well, it's also going to be with an A. And if I have a C, it's going to be with a G with three hydrogen bonds. So that would be my other backbone. That would be a full DNA molecule. So you can tell from one half what the other side has to be. There's no other option. So this works out really well because DNA acts like a zipper. Think about a zipper on your jacket. You can zip it up and zip it down and it always has to pair exactly one little metal piece with the next and the zipper is kind of like responsible for pairing them together or separating them. Okay, so that's kind of like our hydrogen bonds are acting like a zipper to hold the two sides together. 
So you have a parental molecule, which is this first one here. So the letters are a little bit fouled up on this, but I mean, if you know that this side is representing T, there's a little A that's like halfway drawn here. A, this would be C and G. Okay, so you can tell that that's a parental DNA. They have a separation, so you're gonna split them apart to have two individual strands. And then you make a new strand of our complementary, this complementary to the parental strand. So if you know that you have an A here, well then this better be a T. And if you have a C here, well this better be a G. So if I give you one half, you can find the other half of the molecule. Well, your body's really cool because they can do that too with these enzymes. So this is basically the overall process of DNA replication, just very much simplified. So we had one molecule of DNA and we end up with two molecules of DNA. And if you notice, they are all genetically identical. They are all the same. AT, AT, AT. They're all the way the same all the way across. So base pairing to a template strand, this is how we are actually going to create the complement. So since the two strands of DNA are complementary, each strand acts as a template for building a new strand in replication. In DNA replication, the parent molecule unwinds and the two daughter strands are built based upon the base pairing rule. So you have your DNA that's like this, and it has to turn into that flat ladder that we've been looking at where like you have the backbones on the outside and then all your little base pairs there, okay? And so that will break apart and you will have a single strand and a single strand. And then you will have a new strand that is synthesized using this as a template. And then the completed molecule will be the same as the original and the same as each other. That is the total process of DNA replication. Okay, so Watson and Crick's semi-conservative model of replication predicts that when a double helix replicates, each daughter molecule will have one old strand and one newly made strand. And I'll tell you a little rhyme to help you with that in a minute. Um, so our competing models where the conservative model um, has our two parent strands rejoined and the dispersive model where you have a mixture of the old and the new. We'll look at those in a second. So the conservative model says that basically you have the parental DNA and that is not ever touched. It's kept exactly the same. And then you have like a newly synthesized molecule altogether. So then the second replication, you'd have mostly brand new DNA with only one molecule of the old DNA. Semi-conservative, Guess what? This one is correct. This is what our bodies actually utilize. You have the parental DNA, which you split open into single strands that are then complemented. So then you can base pair that new lighter blue strand, um, which then gives you this overall replication. That's exactly what we use. Okay, the dispersive model is just saying that you take some fragments of old and you embed it with some fragments of new. This literally makes no sense because how can you like split up the parental DNA and add other stuff into it? You've now completely changed the DNA for that individual. So the experiments by Meselson and Stahl supported the semi-conservative model. I think it's gonna go into that next. Okay, so this is the experiment of Meselson and Stahl. So basically they have bacteria that they grew in a medium that had a heavy isotope of nitrogen. And then they transferred that to a medium that had a lighter version of nitrogen. So basically the bacteria as it's pulling from, you know, the environment or within itself to incorporate nitrogen into its um, CHONP, CHONP that makes up DNA that nitrogen is either going to be light or it's going to be heavy, okay? So basically, after you centrifuge, after the first replication, so the DNA is being replicated in these bacteria, um, you can see that the band is just one band. You don't see a heavy band and a light band with the two different nitrogens. You see one, one band. So it tells you that it has both the light and the heavy in there. And then um, it's like a mixture, right? And then after the second um, replication, then you can see two separate bands, one that's less dense and one that's more dense because one has more of the N15 and one has more of the N14 because you have the parental, which came from like this region, and then this would be like the replicated here, okay? So we know that the semi-conservative model is what we utilize. 
because when you have our first replication, it is half old DNA, half new DNA, which is going to give you that central band because it contains half of the heavy isotope and half of the lighter isotope. And then in our second replication, which we discovered up here, we'd actually end up with some all new essentially. So we have the all new, which is going to be from the lighter medium. And then we still have that original um, mix where we have that um, medium band there. So that has the best, that supported the semi-conservative model, that had the best evidence for the semi-conservative model. Um, and there's a little, is there room for me to draw here? No. Okay, great. I'll draw here. Um, I like to tell my kids like a little rhyme to go with this. Okay. This will work. So if I have a DNA template and I have C, T, G, and it has the base pairs G, A, C. That's my DNA strand. Okay, now let's say that we're gonna replicate that. So we're going to split the hydrogen bonds and separate the strands. So if you just move them apart, C, T, G, nothing changes there. And over here you have your G, A, C. But then we use that as a template in order to base pair. So we know if you have a C, you better have a G. If you have a T, you better have an A. If you have a G, you better have a C. Okay. And then on the other side, same thing. Notice that now we have two new molecules of DNA. So we have replicated the DNA and it's identical to the original, but they're also identical to each other. They're all exactly the same. So here's my little rhyme to help you remember the semi-conservative model. Okay, when you have DNA replication, half is old, half is new, half is red, half is blue. Because typically in textbooks, they use red and blue to show you the strands, to show you the differences between them instead of like this blue and dark blue sort of thing. So half is old, half is new, half is red, half is blue. So this is literally the diagram to help you remember that. Okay, so let's take a closer look at DNA replication. It is an involved process, so buckle up. Okay, so the copying of DNA is remarkable in its speed and its accuracy, which is great because if it messes up, that means that you're gonna get cancer. Okay, um, more than a dozen enzymes and other proteins participate in DNA replication. Uh, much more is known about how this replication machine works in bacteria than in eukaryotes. Eukaryotic um, DNA replication is really complicated. Um, so in bacteria, it's a little easier because they're less complex organisms, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, most of the process is similar between prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but eukaryotes, there's definitely some extra steps that have to occur because our genomes are a lot larger and more complicated. Okay, so replication begins at a particular site that's called the origin of replication. Well, thankfully that makes sense because if it's the origin, that's where it starts. And if it's of replication, well, that's where the replication or the copying is about to begin. Great, aptly named. Okay, um, where the two DNA strands are separated, opening up in a replication bubble. Okay, at each end of the bubble is a replication fork. Think about a fork in the road. You literally have two directions that you can run. You'll see an image of this in a second. For a Y-shaped region where the parental strands of DNA are being unwound. So let's look at that. So this is the Y-shaped region. This is one half of the bubble. The other half of the bubble would just like kind of come down and be a Y facing the other direction, okay? So you have topoisomerase. That's how you say this lovely word right here. Topoisomerase is responsible for unwinding. So it's taking it from this to like the ladder that we're used to looking at. That's what topoisomerase does, okay? There's other proteins and things that are involved in that, but topoisomerase unwinds the DNA. Helicase, ASE, 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 all right? These are all enzymes. Helicase, another enzyme, is responsible for 
unzipping. So I'm going to say Topo Isomeres unwinds because it does this. It's unwinding it. Okay, Helicase unzips. And if you're, you know, in high school and you think it's funny to be like, oh, Helicase is unzipping your jeans, like G-E-N-E-S, not like on your legs, duh, right? Helicase is going to unzip your jeans, quite literally, by separating the DNA into two separate strands. Okay, so primase is going to lay down a primer of RNA. So that's what this little red guy is right here. So this is an RNA primer that is laid down by primase, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this whole picture is an example of a replication fork, and so far we've talked about topoisomerase and how it unwinds DNA, then helicase, this is like one, helicase is going to unzip right? It's going to unzip the DNA. So you have two separate strands. And thirdly, primase is going to lay down an RNA primer. Okay. Then we also have these little guys down here called single-stranded binding proteins. Basically, they're single-stranded binding, which means that they only bind to a single strand. That makes sense. Okay. So they're binding to the single strands because these are kind of like magnets. Like they want to snap back together. That's the desire. But having these little guys here is acting like a chaperone at a prom. They are preventing them from getting together, okay? That is the point of a single-stranded binding protein. So helicases are enzymes that, this says untwist, which is like, mm, it actually unzips, but like, okay. Untwisting is actually like topoisomerase, but it's okay. So helicases are enzymes that untwist the double helix at the replication forks. The single-stranded binding proteins bind to and stabilize the single-stranded DNA. They're, sim they're stabilizing it because they're not allowing it to go back together. They have to remain separate or you can't duplicate the strands. Okay, and topoisomerase is relieving the strain um, that might be caused by twisting. So if you think about, like, think about, girls, you've probably done this. If you have, like, long hair and you twist it 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 and you keep going, eventually it, like, doubles up on itself, right, to kind of create its own little double helix. So topoisomerase prevents that from happening as you're unwinding the DNA. So, like, you're, there's different types of topoisomerase, and technically one of them is kind of unwinding it and the other one is preventing tension. So it creates these little cuts. You don't really need to know that. But if you stood at one end of a room and your friend stood at the other end of the room and you were each holding an end of like a rope or a string and one of you just twisted and twisted and twisted and twisted forever, eventually that string is going to double up on itself and create a spiral. So essentially topoisomerase is relieving that sort of tension that's happening to the DNA because you don't want it to do that and you also don't want it to break. So that's what's happening here. This looks complicated, but this is the overall picture. Okay, so look here that we are dealing with E. coli, which is a bacteria, which is what we know a whole lot more about, and then the origins of replication in a eukaryotic cell. So eukaryotic cells are larger. Their DNA is also larger. Um, you'll see that you have multiple bubbles, multiple replication forks occurring in our eukaryotic cell, whereas in our um, E. coli, you have your, you know, your single... Um, chromosome here that you have one origin of replication with one replication bubble, okay? You are going to create two identical copies of DNA at the end here, and you will also create two identical copies of DNA here. So the process is similar, but a little bit more complicated in eukaryotes. And of course, the end product, you're duplicating that particular organism's DNA. So our DNA is more linear, whereas a E. coli or bacterial cell has more um, circular DNA. Okay, so multiple replication bubbles form and eventually fuse, speeding up the copying of the DNA. So that's what you can kind of see happening here. So you have all these bubbles and then they start to elongate and eventually like they'll meet up in the middle. So then it's just like, boom, the whole thing's being copied. So DNA polymerases cannot initiate synthesis of a polynucleotide, so of DNA, um, they can only add nucleotides to an already existing chain um, that's base pairing with the template. So basically that's why we have primase, which is that little red bubble in the picture we talked about a few minutes ago that laid down that RNA primer that was also red. So the initial nucleotide, <laughs> nucleotide strand is a short RNA primer and that is laid down by primase. It's an RNA primer laid down by primase. ASE tells you it is an enzyme. 
So the enzyme primase, hey, look at that, um, starts an RNA chain from a single RNA nucleotide and adds RNA nucleotides one at a time using the parental DNA as a template. The primer is short, typically anywhere from five to 10 nucleotides long. The new DNA strand will start from the three prime end of the RNA primer. Okay, so we have the primer that's laid down and then the DNA will start at the three prime end of the RNA primer. So enzymes called DNA polymerases. Let's think about what that word means. What's poly? Poly means many. What's mer? Mer means piece or part. And ACE tells you that it is an enzyme. DNA polymerases, polymerases, many pieces enzyme. So DNA, many pieces enzyme. So it's an enzyme that's going to add a many pieces of DNA. That makes sense. Pieces of DNA are called nucleotides. So look at that. That's how it all works. Okay. So enzymes called DNA polymerases catalyze the elongation of new DNA at a replication fork. Most DNA polymerases require a primer and a DNA template strand. Um, the rate of elongation is about 500 nucleotides per second in a bacteria and about 50 per second in a human. So each nucleotide is added to a growing DNA. Um, it's going to consist of the sugar attached to the base and three phosphate groups. Okay, so it's a actual triphosphate. So it's called DATP um, because it's just a slightly different structure. So the DATP is used to make DNA and is similar to the ATP of the energy metabolism. Like, you know, the mitochondria makes ATP. It's the powerhouse of the cell. If you know anything about biology, you know that. Okay, the difference is that um, is in the sugars that DATP is deoxyribose while ATP has ribose. So it's called DATP because it contains deoxyribose that's going to help to make our DNA. Okay, um, as each monomer, the nucleotides, join the DNA strand, it loses two phosphate groups as the molecule, as a molecule of pyrophosphate, which is usually like PPI, it's pyrophosphate. Um, so basically, if you have a, um, a sugar that has three phosphates attached to it, as it's joining the chain, you cleave off the last two, and that's pyrophosphates, just the name of that, PPI. And then you're left over with a sugar and a phosphate, which is convenient because that's the backbone of DNA. Okay, cool. So this is kind of what that looks like. So we have our template strand here. So this is the backbone that I just outlined, and then we have all of our nucleotides, I'm sorry, our nitrogenous bases in the middle. Um, then our new strand, we have a nucleotide that was added here, we have a nucleotide that was added here, one that was added here. So we're adding to the three prime end always. So here we're adding in a special nucleotide that has the three, this is a D, um, DATP essentially because you have our three um, phosphate groups there. You of course have an A, which means you're adding in a T. So when we join the bonds here with this OH, right, you're going to cleave off two of these phosphates, which is going to be released as uh, pyrophosphate. So you can see that happening here. So DNA polymerase is gonna catalyze the reaction here, which is going to add that last uh, nucleotide for us and we're going to release our pyrophosphate. So anti-parallel elongation. The anti-parallel structure of the double helix affects the replication. Remember that we said that it's anti-parallel, so one direction and the other direction. So for instance, if this was three prime and this was five prime, this would have to be five prime and three, hello, three prime. They run in opposite directions, okay? So the DNA polymerases add nucleotides to the three prime end of the growing strand. I like to think three is free. It is the free end, three is free. That's where the DNA is gonna add to. It never grows in the five prime direction ever. Three is free, that's where the new nucleotides are going to attach. Therefore, a new DNA strand can elongate only from five prime towards three prime. It can never go the other way. Okay, along one template strand of DNA, um, the DNA polymerase synthesizes the leading strand continuously. 
that's very important. The leading strand is made continuously, which is going to move towards the replication fork. So here's the overall view. Okay, so here's our little bubble. We have our replication forks. So we have the, um, the leading strand is labeled for you right here. It's this light blue region. You can see that it's growing in this direction. That is our leading strand. It is made in one continuous piece. Okay. Um, so let's see, that's represented down here. So we have, first of all, we have, you know, the topo isomerase, which went through and it is relieving the stress and helping to unwind. And then our helicase is helping to unzip and to unwind. Our single stranded binding proteins are helping the two strands stay apart. We have our RNA primer that has been laid down and notice that this is the five prime end right here, which means that this end has to be the three prime end. That's where our um, DNA polymerase three, that's what this guy is here. Okay, he's adding to the three prime end because three is free. So he's adding nucleotides there. And if it's going this way, it's going to go until it reaches the end of the molecule and it's done. Okay, so that's a leading strand. So that's what's happening here. It's a continuous elongation. To elongate the other strand called the lagging strand, DNA polymerase must work in the direction away from the replication fork. So it's not going to be going this direction. It's going to be going and like it's unzipping this way. Everything is moving this way. So now we're going to have to go this way, which is kind of weird. Okay. The lagging strand is synthesized in a series of segments. So not continuous in little chunks. And these chunks are called Okazaki fragments. And it's really cute that Okazaki is the last name of the husband and wife scientist that discovered them. How cute is that? Okay. So let me just level with you here for a second. Leading. Great. Leading, continuous. Leading, perfect, nothing's wrong there. Lagging. If you're a gamer like myself, don't at me for playing Xbox, okay? Halo came out on Xbox, so forever, Halo fan, Xbox fan, you can go play PS4 by yourself, whatever, that's fine. Anyway, lagging. If you're a video gamer of any kind, lagging is bad. It is not smooth. It is choppy. It is annoying. That's exactly what's happening here. A lagging strand is choppy and annoying. That's exactly what's happening. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Um, we'll take a look at it in just a second. I lied to you. So after the formation of our Okazaki fragments, DNA polymerase one has to go back in and remove all of these bunches of RNA primers to replace with nucleotides of DNA. And then it has to glue all the pieces back together because it's not made in one piece because it's lagging and it's choppy and it's made in all these fragments called Okazaki fragments. You need all these extra enzymes just to go back in and fix this ish. So that's what's going on with lagging. That's why it's not as fun. Okay, so this looks a little complicated, but this is the overall structure of our replication bubble, right? We've already talked about the leading strand. We're talking about the lagging strand now. So basically we're still moving overall in this direction right? Everything is moving in, in this, you know, leftwards direction. So the fork is opening up this way. So RNA primer is going to signal to DNA polymerase that it's time to attach. So it's going to attach here and it's going to be adding on to the three prime end because that's what it does. So it makes this first little number one fragment. But the replication fork is going this way. So now there's more crap for it to make over here, right? It doesn't know because it's moving in this direction. So these little RNA primers need to be added again, which signal, hey, time to start here, okay? So that's essentially what's happening. So you have your, um, your one that you made right here. Then you need to add on another primer to tell your um, DNA polymerase that it's time to make this next section. Meanwhile, everything else is going this way. So you have this tail that's continuously growing of like, hey, you, keep, you need to keep popping off and go back. How do you tell it to go back? You have to add more primers. So eventually like you end up with a whole bunch of all these little fragments and you can see that then you have to have DNA polymerase one, sorry that the numbers got messed up, 
this is DNA polymerase one, whereas um, DNA polymerase three is what's actually synthesizing. It's adding all these little bases. And then DNA polymerase one is gonna go in and take out those RNA primers and replace them with our DNA. And then DNA ligase acts like glue. It's molecular glue. It's gonna glue all those strands back together. So you have these extra enzymes just because the lagging strand has to be in the wrong direction. And if you're walking this way, for the, everyone else is walking this way and you gotta go in this direction, you gotta keep popping off and moving back and then you meet up again and then you pop off and then you meet up again. That's what's happening for the lagging strand because it has to move in that direction. So that's the overall picture of what's happening here, essentially. You have to keep like moving backwards because the fork is opening up this way. So all of this is like new, right? So then of course you have your DNA polymerase one and ligase to go back and fix your Okazaki fragments to make a smooth completed piece of DNA. Okay, so the proteins that participate in DNA replication form a large complex, a DNA replication machine, if you will. So the DNA replication machine may be stationary during the replication process. Um, recent studies support a model in which DNA polymerase molecules reel in parental DNA and extrude newly made daughter DNA molecules. So kind of like this, it's this, this machinery that doesn't really move, but the DNA is what's kind of like being pulled through it essentially. So it's kind of like this little conveyor belt of like continuous motion between the parental DNA and then you're kind of like spitting out like the completed DNA segments. So proofreading and repairing DNA. So DNA polymerase is pretty awesome because it doesn't make a lot of mistakes, but occasionally it does make a mistake, but it does have the opportunity to go back and fix its mistake. So DNA polymerase is proofread newly made DNA replacing any incorrect nucleotides. For instance, if it says you have an A and you pair it with a G, you know that that cannot happen. It has to be a T, right? So that's, that's what this proofreading mechanism is for. So in mismatched repair of DNA, other enzymes correct errors in the base pairing. So like I said, if you don't put an A with a T or a G with a C, you make a mistake. This is called a mismatched repair. Um, so the hereditary defect in one such enzyme is associated with a form of colon cancer. Colon cancer is super scary because they like recently discovered that like if your parents have it, like you go and get it. It's not like a maybe, like you will someday. And there's like not a lot of symptoms or anything and there's no like pain associated with it. So it's like pretty terrifying. I used to work in colonic cancer diagnostics and it's like really sad. Anyway, um, so there is a defect in one such enzyme that's associated with the form of colon cancer because of this mismatch that cannot be repaired correctly. And this defect allows cancer causing errors to accumulate in DNA faster than normal. So typically, like I said, DNA polymerase, it's really great at making sure that it doesn't make mistakes, but if it does, it does have the opportunity to go back and fix them. But for some reason, if you have some sort of defect of um, you know, the enzymes that are proofreading enzymes that can go back and edit the DNA to make sure that you're A-OK -okay and good to go, then that's what's going to cause um, cancer because you're gonna have all these different mutations occurring. So DNA can be damaged by exposure to harmful chemicals or physical agents such as cigarette smoke and x-rays. It can also undergo spontaneous changes, spontaneous mutations. So in um, nucleotide excision repair, a nuclease, ASE tells you that's an enzyme, cuts out and replaces damaged stretches of DNA. So essentially you can see here that this is not working. There's something going on that should not be happening there. So DNA nuclease is gonna go in and it's gonna cut out like on either side of the damaged region or the region that is giving it a red flag. And then it's gonna go in and allow DNA polymerase to rematch, so to fix its error. And then DNA ligase is gonna glue the backbone back together because DNA ligase is the glue that glues the backbone together. So everyone is happy and healthy. Our DNA is repaired, no issues. So there is an um, evolutionary significance of altered DNA nucleotides. So error rate after proofreading repair is low, but it's not zero. It can't catch every single error and every single replication when there's loads of them happening at the same time in your body. 
Um, sequence changes may become permanent and can be passed on to the next generation. Typically, we're talking about your germline cells, so your sex cells, your gametes, if there's a um, sequence that is copied incorrectly in your gametes, then that will be passed on to the next generation because your gametes immediately go in to create the next generation. Um, so these changes or mutations are the source of the genetic variation upon which natural, natural selection operates. So evolution, again, is a huge theme throughout DNA repair and all we, everything in biology, essentially. Natural selection is like the overarching, like, end-all, be-all of biology. So basically, genetic variation is necessary for natural selection, the survival of the fittest, to occur. So mutations aren't always a bad thing. Most of the time, they're neutral, which means that they're not helpful or harmful. They just happen to have a change as an effect, right? So that's a genetic variation. Any change is a variation, which is what natural selection acts upon. Now, if it's harmful, obviously, that's something that's not going to be perpetuated because then they won't be the fittest, so they're not going to survive. But if it gives an advantage, then that would be perpetuated in a population. And that is something that you can see that will change, you know, over time, the whole population. So replicating the ends of DNA molecules. So limitations of DNA polymerase create problems for the linear DNA of our eukaryotic chromosomes. So the usual replication machinery cannot complete the five prime ends of the daughter strands. So repeated rounds of replication produce shorter and shorter DNA molecules with uneven ends. Eukaryotic chromosomal DNA molecules have a special nucleotide sequence at their ends called telomeres. So telomeres do not prevent the shortening of DNA molecules, but they postpone it. So it's kind of like a little protective cap, like an aglet on your shoelace. It's kind of this little protective cap on the end of our DNA called telomeres. Um, it's been proposed that the shortening of telomeres is connected to aging. And actually there's a whole conspiracy theory on this that like if you've done like 23andMe or Ancestry.com or you give them your DNA that they're saving it because then when they figure out how to fix your telomeres and reverse the aging process, you need a sample of your younger self DNA and that that's how they're going to try to sell it back to you, like sell you your spit from when you were a kid and did this test like later in life when you're trying to like reverse the aging process because you're getting old as heck, right? that they're going to charge you all kinds of money to be like, hey, you want your spit back? You want this DNA back with your young little telomeres floating around in it? That's going to be a billion dollars. Conspiracy theories. I like buying into it just a little bit. But basically, telomere shortening is what's causing aging. That's kind of like the hypothesis there. So if chromosomes of germ cells become shorter in every cell cycle, essential genes would eventually be missing from the gametes they produce. Because think about the telomeres. If it's just this little cap, and then each time that you're replicating, you're getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Eventually, that telomere is going to be gone, and you're going to be eating away the ends of all your genes, which means that eventually you're going to have an issue with having all the genes in the cells. So an enzyme called um, telomerase is going to catalyze the lengthening of the telomeres in our germ cells in order to protect that DNA. Telomerase is not active in most human somatic cells. A somatic cell, if you recall, is a body cell. So it's a cell that makes up your body, not going on to make up someone else's body like a fetus that's making up you, like your hair, your eyes, your toes, your nails, your body cells. So it's not active in those. However, it does show... Um, inappropriate activity in some of our cancer cells, which means that it could be kind of like protecting our cancer cells because they're rapidly dividing, which you would think like eventually they'd kind of like lose their potential to keep going accurately, but they don't. So there's some sort of inappropriate activity of our telomerases there. So telomerase is currently under study as a target for cancer therapies, because if you can prevent it from functioning in cancer cells, then the cancer cells will, you know, the DNA will keep getting deteriorated with each division instead of being protected by telomerase. So a chromosome consists of a DNA molecule packed together with proteins. So the bacterial chromosome is a double-stranded circular DNA molecule associated with a small amount of proteins. So our eukaryotic chromosomes have linear DNA molecules associated with a large amount of proteins because our DNA is huge compared to a bacterial DNA. So in a bacterium, the DNA is supercoiled and found in a region of the cell called the nucleoid region. Remember that a bacteria typically is either like a circle or kind of like a rod shaped like bacillus. And then there's like, you know, your free floating DNA, but it's localized in one area. And that area is called the nucleoid or the nucleoid region. 
So chromatin is a complex of DNA and protein because we just said in all kinds of organisms, both are eukaryotic and are prokaryotic, that you have DNA and protein as a complex together. So chromatin is a complex of DNA and protein and it's found in the nucleus of our eukaryotes. Okay, so you remember that your cells are more round and that you have a nucleus and that your DNA is lovely and compacted in there. Okay, so chromosomes fit into the nucleus through an elaborate multi-level system of packaging. So chromatin undergoes um, striking changes in the degree of packing during the course of the cell cycle. So essentially the cell cycle, you have very structured DNA because if you're about to split it and replicate it and all of that, you cannot have this loosey goosey bowl of spaghetti going on. You gotta have compact units that are easy to be like, you go here and you go here. None of this like, you know, intertangling and having all kinds of mutations because you don't have enough DNA in some places or you broke it because it's all stuck together. It's very organized, very compact. So you can see that here. So you have our double helix. There's these little guys called histones and they, so DNA has a negative charge on it. And when you try to supercoil something that has a negative charge, negative charge and negative charge are going to repel. So these histones are positively charged, which allows the molecule of DNA to wrap around it because negative and positive want to be together. So they're going to attach to each other, which allows like, uh, it's a, like a relieving the tension essentially of those negative uh, forces acting on each other by adding in these histones. So you have a whole bunch of histones that are going to come in and it kind of creates this little guy called like a nucleosome. And then you end up getting these little loops. So basically it's just um, associating the DNA like tighter and tighter with all of these little histones and they're super coiling and bundling up together until you have a chromatid in a chromosome. This is a replicated chromosome. One chromosome would just be, you know, one half of this, but your chromatid is just one half here. And that is how our DNA is super looped and super organized and super tightly packed together, despite all of these forces that make it not want to do that. So at interphase, most of the chromatid is compacted into a 30 nanometer fiber, which is folded further in some areas by looping, which we see here. Um, even during interphase, centromeres and some other parts of the chromosomes are highly condensed, similar to the metaphase chromosomes. This condensed chromatin is called heterochromatin. Um, the more dispersed, less compact uh, chromatin is called euchromatin. Personally, I will not be asking about that. I just need you to know that basically DNA can be tightly packed together because histones help to relieve the you know, forces from the negative, uh, negative charges acting on each other by introducing a more positive charge to allow these supercoils and loops to exist. Dense packaging of the heterochromatin makes it largely inaccessible to the machinery responsible for transcribing genetic information. Transcribing is dealing with protein synthesis. So that's kind of like the next thing that we're going to be talking about in the next chapter. So basically it's saying that if it's all tightly packed and it's all wound together and it's like this, well, how the heck are you supposed to get an enzyme in there to do anything? Well, you can't. That's the point. Okay. So actually we were down here. Okay. So the chromosomes are dynamic in structure. A condensed region may be loosened in order for, you know, transcribing or modified as needed for various cellular processes. For example, histones can undergo chemical modifications that result in changes in the chromatin organization. For instance, you can add uh, different um, functional groups to the end of our histones to then change their charge overall, which will then either tighten DNA's grip on them or loosen it. If you make the histones more negative, it will loosen, which then you can get enzymes in there to do something like modify the DNA or transcribe the DNA. Um, so we're going to look at understanding DNA structure and the replication and how that makes genetic engineering possible. So genetic engineering is really interesting. It's so crazy. It's even over my head sometimes, the things that we are able to do with genetic engineering. So complementary base pairing of DNA is the basis for uh, nucleic uh, acid hybridization. So the base pairing of one strand of a nucleic acid to another in this complementary sequence. So you have a nucleic acid hybridization and it forms the foundation of virtually every technique used in genetic engineering, the direct manipulation of genes for practical purposes. So we're going to be talking about um, making multiple copies of a gene and other DNA segments. And this is 
happening all the time and it's very beneficial. So to work directly for specific genes, scientists prepare well-defined segments of DNA and identical copies, a process called DNA cloning, where you just replicate a certain region or the whole thing of DNA. Most methods for cloning pieces of DNA in the laboratory share general features. So many bacteria contain plasmids, which is just circular DNA molecules that replicate separately from the bacterial chromosome. So remember that our bacteria have their, you know, their DNA lumped up in the middle. Typically it's like a, you know, a long circle sort of thing. You also have this extra chromosomal DNA in these little plasmids, which are little small circular DNA molecules. So that could be something that they picked up from the environment or something that they received from another bacteria and things like that. So to clone these pieces of DNA, researchers first obtain a plasmid and insert DNA from another source, foreign DNA, into that plasmid. And then the resulting plasmid is called recombinant DNA. So essentially, you can isolate these little plasmids. You can insert your desired DNA and then reintroduce it to bacteria. So then they'll pick that up with the new genes in it and then they'll start making whatever proteins are associated with those genes. So that's essentially what's happening here. So you have a bacterium, you have a bacterial chromosome, and then you have a plasmid. So first things first, you have isolated the plasmid and the gene is inserted into the plasmid. Cause so you've taken a cell containing the gene of interest. That's your desired DNA that you have incorporated into the plasmid here. So then the plasmid is put back into the bacterial cells. Typically bacterial cells are glee. <laughs> bacterial cells are greedy. So if you put plasmids in an area near a bacterium, it's going to like take that in. It's going to incorporate it back into its little cellular body. So then the host cell grown, um, it's gonna be grown in culture, does form a clone of the cells that contain that gene. So basically then this cell will be allowed to replicate. So then we will have, you know, extra copies of all of this. And we will have the protein that is expressed and we are able to harvest that protein. So um, like human growth hormone, insulin is grown this way, which a lot of people require insulin, which is really amazing that we're able to grow it like this. Um, there's different proteins that can help to um, stop like heart attacks, like dissolve blood clots and heart attack therapy. You can also then isolate the genes and then incorporate them into other organisms for like pest resistance. We have uh, our corn plants or strawberry plants. There's a bunch of them that are GMOs. Oh my God, genetically modified organisms. Listen, it's DNA. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It's not harmful. You're made of the same cellular pieces. So people who are like, mm, I'm GMO free. Well, okay, so you're just gonna pay more money for your food, like jokes on you. Like that's kind of dumb. But that's on you, it's America, your choice. Anywhere else in the world, I don't know about your choices there because I'm not from there, sorry about it, okay? Um, you can also have copies of genes, like these desired genes that you're incorporating into different bacteria in order to make them better at bioremediation, which is like cleaning up the environment due to like oil spills and things like that. So genetic engineering is really cool because basically you can be like, hey, this gene over here in this weird organism, I like it. I want it to be in this organism over there and you can make it happen, and it's crazy. So the production of multiple copies of a single gene is called gene cloning, because you're making copies of a gene and you're cloning it, and that's what that is. So gene cloning is useful to make many copies of a gene and to produce a protein product, because genes are segments of DNA that code for a protein. So your proteins are the actual, like either trait or enzyme or item that's going to be the desired product. So the ability to amplify many copies of a gene is crucial for applications involving a single gene. So if you have a single gene, then you're able to clone it to make more of it and then incorporate it somewhere else if need be. So restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes allow recombination, like they, it may, it may, they make it possible. So bacterial restriction enzymes cut DNA molecules at specific DNA sequences called restriction sites. So these little enzymes just like our nucleases, it cut the DNA. These are going to cut DNA in a predictable way. Like we know, oh, this restriction enzyme, it's gonna do this. We know exactly where it's going to cut. So restriction enzyme usually makes many cuts yielding restriction fragments. So like this. So restriction enzymes cut the sugar backbone of 
DNA. Okay, so here's your restriction site, and you can see that you have a cut that was made here and a cut that was made here, and then you've separated these two strands. These are called sticky ends because there's a spot where you would stick, you know, new nucleotides. So this is a sticky end. A blunt end would just be if it ended and there were no like hangover, which is like a little bit harder. So the sticky ends allow better incorporation of genes. So the DNA fragment is added from another molecule cut by the same enzyme. If it's cut by the same enzyme, then these little sticky ends are going to be the same. So you have this predictable cut that you know will fuse back in with the original green DNA. So then DNA ligase is going to seal the strands together to make like one solid piece of DNA again. And then your, um, your enzymes, any enzymes are going to go right through and they're going to read this as if it wasn't new DNA, like it just existed always, which is really cool. So to see the fragments produced by cutting DNA molecules with restriction enzymes, researchers use gel electrophoresis. So this technique separates a mixture of nucleic acid fragments based on length. So essentially, if you have a piece of DNA and you use all these restriction enzymes and you cut it into pieces, you can tell how big each of the pieces are, the fragments, by running on a gel electrophoresis. So essentially, you have the mixture of the DNA molecules of the different sizes. You're going to run them on a gel agarose, and you're going to have that in a liquid. It's like a buffering liquid. And you put that all inside of this apparatus called a gel electrophoresis machine. And you have a power source that is going to send an electrical current through because remember, DNA is negatively charged. So it will run towards an anode or a positively charged region. Um, so you'll see that the... Um, DNA will actually spread out based on its size. So think about a sponge and how it has all these little holes. It's very porous. It's got all these like little channels and holes throughout it. Gel agarose, the thing that this is being put into, is like that on a microscopic level. It looks like a clear piece or a clear sheet of jello, like gelatin. That's essentially what it is, but it's a little bit fancier than that. You cannot just get it at the grocery store. Um, so it has all these little channels and holes and things and basically the DNA has to kind of swim through that as it's being pulled towards a positive end. So it's going to separate based on fragments. And if it's a really, really big fragment, it's going to take forever to go through all those little holes and everything. So it's going to stay pretty close up to the where the wells like the original source is. If it's a tiny little small strand of DNA, a little tiny fragment, it's only a couple base pairs long, that mug is going to fly down this gel. And it's going to have all these little tiny bands out at the end because it's very small. So it's easily snaked through all those little holes and things like that. Then you can add different dyes in order to see um, your DNA bands, your restriction fragments on your gel under different lighting. So you can see that the shorter molecules um, have impeded less than the longer ones. So they move faster through the gel. So these are going to be the smaller fragments here, and these will be the larger fragments here. These are the wells in which you put them. That's actually the trickiest part of this, and we're going to practice this in my class to make sure that you don't look like an idiot when you get to college and you do this. Um, so then, of course, the DNA is running in this direction. So the most useful restriction enzymes cleave the DNA in a staggered manner to produce sticky ends. That's what I was talking about before. So let's look back at the green. These are our sticky ends because it's a predictable cut and it's already ready to receive its base pairs. That's why that's advantageous, okay? So sticky ends can bond with complementary sticky ends of another fragment. So if you use the same restriction enzyme to cut two different pieces of DNA, well then you can just stick those two pieces of DNA together because the sticky ends are ready to pair. So DNA ligates can then close the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA strands in order to create one smooth DNA strand again. So in gene cloning, the original plasmid is called a cloning vector. That's the original. So the cloning vector is a DNA molecule that can carry foreign DNA into a host and replicate there. So you have your cloning vector that you're going to insert. You're going to open it up, basically break the ring. You're going to insert foreign DNA, and then you're going to seal it back together with DNA ligase. So now you have this new 
plasmid that has the desired gene that then you're going to put into, let's say, a bacterial cell, and you're going to have that bacterial cell, you know, all the little ribosomes in there are going to transcribe and translate that um, gene in order to create the protein product. So you can do this in vitro. Um, the polymerase chain reaction is used in cloning. So polymerase chain reaction PCR uh, can produce many copies of a specific target segment of DNA. So there's a three-step cycle that brings about a chain reaction that produces an exponentially uh, growing population of identical DNA molecules. The key to PCR is an unusual heat-stable DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase, T-A-Q, TAC polymerase. So basically they do this at crime scenes too. If you have just a very small amount of DNA that you want to use, you're gonna need extra copies of it, right? So let's say that at a crime scene, they discover a very small little bit of DNA, but they can't actually do any testing on it because it's like hardly anything. If you run that through PCR, you're going to amplify that exponentially. So now you have all of this sample to work with. So you can do the same thing when it comes to cloning because you're cloning that specific section of DNA that you're after. And then you can go and put it into multiple organisms or multiple bacteria and test different things depending on what your study is. So here's kind of the process of that. So you have a cycle one that yields two molecules. So you have denaturation, which means that you're gonna be separating your DNA. You're gonna be annealing, which is going to be creating the um, template. With the templates, you're going to be creating the new strands. And then the extensions, you're going to be finishing the new molecules of DNA. Cycle two is going to yield four molecules. And then cycle three is going to yield eight molecules with two molecules um, in the white box are gonna be the uh, match tar matching the target sequence. So PCR amplification alone cannot substitute for gene cloning in our cells. Instead, PCR is used to provide the specific DNA fragment to be cloned. So PCR primers are synthesized to include a restriction site that matches the site on the cloning vector. This way it's easier to incorporate because it already has the correct site. Um, so the fragment and the vector are cut and then ligated back together. That's how you have the plasmid that has the desired gene in it. And then you can go and implant that in a bacterial cell and it will grow there. So that's essentially what I was just saying. So you have the cloning vector that you have opened up and you have the um, DNA fragment obtained by PCR. It's cut by the same restriction enzyme used on the cloning vector, which means that it will fit like a perfect puzzle piece. And the ligation will occur because DNA um, ligase will go in and seal the backbone in order to create your recombinant DNA plasmid. So now whatever this gene is, you're able to express in a bacterial cell. So DNA sequencing, once a gene is cloned, complementary base pairing can be exploited to determine the gene's complete nucleotide sequence. This process is called DNA sequencing. So essentially, you're able to identify like if it's A, T, G, C, what order are all of those nucleotide bases in? or those nitrogenous bases in, sorry. So the next generation sequencing techniques um, developed in the last 10 years are rapid and very um, inexpensive. Um, they sequence by synthesizing the complementary strand of a single immobilized template strand. So they're able just to base pair right there. Um, the A chemical trick enables the electronic monitors to identify which nucleotide is being added at each step which is kind of like a, an easy way to identify, oh, if it's adding in an A, well, then there must have been a T there. So you're able to go through and synthesize like what, you're able to tell what the order of all of the nucleotides on the template strand were. And then you can use that to then compare um, evolutionary history, comparisons with other organisms, to target certain areas, and then add in your restriction sites and things like that. So this is a kind of huge and really, really awesome area of biology that is growing so fast, especially in our day and time right now. That's gonna be it for this chapter. Our next chapter is gonna be talking about how we go from genes into proteins, I believe. So it's gonna be talking about protein synthesis, which is another kind of complicated process. DNA replication is not that complicated. You have your leading strand, your lagging strand, and then all of the associated enzymes that you'll need to know what they do, the order that they work in, and why Okazaki fragments exist, why they have to be made that way, and why they kind of suck, right? So thanks for sticking with me, and I'll see you in the next one.